We start off this program by Groton has many, many landmarks. And I'm going to go through a few uh, so you'll understand the significant landmarks that Groton has. This is the Fort Griswold Monument. And this is probably one of my most cherished photographs in my collection. You will see photographs with the monument, with the old school, the old Groton High School, or you'll see photographs with the monument with the, the present Groton High School. If you come from Groton, you probably remember the Griswold Hotel. It was one of the largest wooden structures in the United States. And of course, it was very popular in its heyday in the 40s and 50s. That was torn down in the late 60s. The Pfizer Corporation purchased the building, raised it. It was going to be their corporate headquarters, but because of the water tide, uh, they couldn't uh, build the foundation. And there's a significant piece of history. That is the first bridge that crossed the Thames River. It was the first railroad bridge, ultimately changed into or converted into a highway bridge. At the time it was built, it was the largest structure or largest, longest span in the world. Here we are at Avery Point. A significant piece of history for Groton was Morton Plant and his estate, as well as his philanthropy activities, contributed a lot to the town of Groton. And then we have the New London Ledge Lighthouse. I call it the Groton Ledge Lighthouse because it's in Groton waters. But at the time, New London had a little bit more power than we did, so they named it New London. Now, in 1930, we came across a new landmark in Groton. And it was the United States Navy Submarine Escape Training Tank. Now, I received a, uh, an email from Betty Ann, uh, I guess a former Navy uh, Navaman, called the library last night and was disturbed that it was being called a tank, that it was called a tower. So I hurriedly went through all of my documents, which included numerous official Navy documents, and it was called a tank. However, many servicemen did call it the tower. Right? So if, if I'm wrong, I don't think I am, but I'll apologize. But everything I have indicates that it is a tank. Now, what was the impetus for building that tank? We have to go way back. So we start off with some submarine tragedies that took place. In September 25 of 1925, the SS-51, uh, which, which uh, at the time it was on maneuvers 14 miles uh, east of Block Island, and it was on the surface, by the way, uh, and it was struck by a merchant ship uh, called the City of Rome, and that's the ship that struck it. There were three people or three sailors on the conning tower when it was struck. They survived. The boat subsequently sunk, and 33 men lost their lives. Uh, the, the reason there was an issue over running lights, uh, that the submarine supposedly didn't have appropriate running lights on it, but it was in 130 feet of water. But we lost 33 men only in 130 feet of water. Now, the initial efforts to raise the submarine through pontoons uh, failed, and ultimately it was raised in June of 26, uh, 1926, so about, about eight months later. And then they brought, it, uh, they brought it to the Brooklyn Navy shipyard, and that's the submarine after, you know, after they raised it and brought it in. Now, <clears throat> a significant thing was the bodies of the 33 men were still on the boat when they brought it in, and they raised a wreath before they brought the the sailors out. So they had the appropriate ceremonies for that. So that was one of the first tragedies that led to it. The second one happened in December 17th of 1927. And this is the uh, SS-4. And it was on maneuvers off of Cape Cod, just off of Provincetown. And this one was submerged. And there was a mile stretch where they conducted these high-speed maneuvers. And the Coast Guard destroyer uh, Paulding was also in the area at the time. And uh, unfortunately, because the water was very choppy, the submarine did have its periscopes up, but 
the, the commander of the uh, Coast Guard destroyer could not see the, uh, the wake from the periscopes until it was too late. And uh, so the Coast Guard boat, the one on the, on the right, the CG-17, ultimately struck the S-4 and it sunk in 110 feet of water. And there were, all together there were 40 lives that were lost. Uh, they went down and uh, tried to raise this. Uh, they had trouble hooking up the lines. Uh, significant thing. This is the boat on the left is the Falcon, which ran out of, it was a, a submarine uh, salvage boat, and it ran out of the sub base in Groton. And they were, they were working on trying to raise the, the, uh, the S-4. On the right is a Navy diver named Thomas Eady. The diver, uh, another diver, and I, I don't recall his name right offhand, went down to hook up an air hose to the submarine that was sunk. And that diver got tangled up in all the wires and things that were being hooked up to try to, to, to salvage the, the boat. And he was just about done for. And Thomas Eddy had previously dived for about six hours, and he volunteered to go down and unravel the, the other diver. This is uh, Mr. Eddy, and as a result of his activities, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. So a very significant event there. That boat was raised in March uh, of 1928 and uh, brought to the Brooklyn Naval Yard. And there it is, they, they had just brought it in. And at the lower right here, uh, they're taking a look at where the uh, Coast Guard boat struck it. And this was the hole that was put inside of the submarine that caused the, the boat to sink. After these tragedies, they, there was a lieutenant, a Navy lieutenant, that was working on a device, that, a breathing device, to help bring sailors up from submarines that were in shallow water. And this was the, what they called the SEA, Submarine Escape Appliance. And the gentleman's name, was, he was a lieutenant at the time, was Munson. And he did develop this lung. And it became accepted by the Navy in 1929. This is Mr. Munson with his lung. And it took me about six months to find that photograph. And guess where I found it? eBay. Where else are you going to find it? Right? <laughs> this is him during the last official test of it uh, when they approved it. So the test was in 1928. They approved it in 1929. As a result of the tragedies and the developing of this SEA, they decided that they wanted to, and there, there's a full view of the, the mumps and lung. And you breathe into it, and it converts uh, carbon dioxide into, into oxygen. They decided to build the United States Navy escape training tank. Now, they started the building in 1930, and it didn't take them long. It took them like nine months to build this. And some of these photographs are quite interesting. This is the foundation. Now, if you look in the back, look at the wheels on the truck. You notice they're wooden wheels, wooden spoke wheels. It's octagonal shaped. It's 36 feet across. The cement was five feet deep. Uh, it had reinforced concrete on on oak and uh, pine pilings. And there was what they called 12 steel holes. Uh, there were rods to hold the tank. And these rods were two and an eighth inch round. And uh, they were placed around the base. You can see them sitting uh, on the foundation. These are the, these are the rods that actually hold the metal uh, plate. And there is the construction, the start of the construction of the tank. Now, ultimately, the tank ended up being 119 and a half feet tall. It was 18 feet in diameter, and it held 250,000 gallons of water. That's a lot of water. Uh, there was a cupola on the top, 
And the cupola is 14 feet high and 25 feet across. And it was, everything was riveted back then, just like the submarines were riveted. And ultimately, it was covered with an insulation and a corrugated cladding. In this photograph here, the steelwork is about 80% complete. Uh, there's another photograph of it, but you can see the steel workers on it. I have a tremendous fear of heights. I don't think I'd be that man on the right there. But these are how the, how the steel workers uh, just perform their duties. Interestingly, later on we'll talk about the demise of, of the tank. But on Facebook, recently there's been articles posted about this presentation tonight. And I had one from a gentleman, I knew his father, and he said, my father helped build that and helped take it down. And we don't have any photographs of the building being taken down or the tower being taken down. But I'm sure if, if I showed him this photo, I'm sure one of those steel workers is probably his father. Two years after they built the tank, because uh, initially the sailors would have to walk the outside of that. Let me go back. You see the stairs? The sailors would have to walk up to the different heights where they would have to, to go enter into the tank to do their dives. So by the time they got up there, they were exhausted. And yet now they had to perform and, and swim and hold their breaths and things like this, which we'll get into. So two years after they constructed the initial tank, they, they constructed an uh, elevator on the outside. And there's the completed tank. Now, as a perspective, remember, now we're talking with 119 feet and 14 feet, we're talking like 125 or 135 feet tall. And when they dive, they came out of these hatch doors, and they had hatches just like they were on submarines. So you open them up, flood the, flood the, uh, the tank in, where they went into, and open up these doors, and then they would enter into the tank, just as if they were coming out of the the escape hatch or a hatch on a submarine, and then go up. Now, most of it, the initial ones, were conducted at about 18 feet. And then they would go down to 50 feet. And then they'd go down to 100 feet. Because actually, the, the deepest area they could dive would be 110 feet from the bottom. Now, when it was built, uh, and everything's relative, it cost $120,000 to construct it. Not bad. It was uh, heated to 92 degrees. The water was heated, and it was clean just like a pool. But, and the reason for keeping it 92 degrees, the trainers, the divers that assisted the, the submariners that were being taught, were in that pool for seven hours a day. So they tried to keep their body temperature close to, close to normal, so they kept the tank at 92 degrees a look inside the tank. This is inside the, the cupola at the top of the tank. Again, it's 25 feet wide. It's 14 feet high. There's a, 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 a recompression chamber in the cupola, but there's also two or three down below. And the reason for that, one, before you even went into the water, We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but before you even went, you had to be tested inside one of those recompression chambers. They, they put you inside and they would bring the, uh, the pressure up to 50 pounds. And if you couldn't take the pressure, you, you were eliminated from the submarine force. So that was the significance of the uh, recompression tank. This is looking up from the bottom. You notice how clean it looks? It's, it's fascinating to see this. And that's looking from the 18-foot door. You, you can see the door that comes out, the hatch that comes out and goes into the tank. And there's a, there's a room inside uh, where they would flood it, bring the pressure up, and then they would go open that door and go out. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in this audience that have done this. Uh, fortunately, I didn't. There's the entrance from if you were on the outside of the tank, where you went into the, the area where they put you inside the tank and then flooded it and pressurized it before you went out into the tank. And this is the entrance at the 110 foot mark. 
And interesting, they would flood this. You would climb, go, climb under and go up through the shaft, if you call it that, and then enter into the, into the tank. And these are interesting. Uh, in my research, I do have the name of the gentleman that painted these, by the way. He's quite an artist. Uh, and I, I see these drawings and I say, who is going to be looking at drawings? If I'm coming out and I've got a survival to go up, I'm not going to. And there was also another one where, the, and I, I'm sure it was just the sailors having fun, there was a no smoking sign outside there. Right? Now, we have an evolution of, of the individual escape techniques, diving techniques of what they used uh, when they first opened the tank. They used that munsum lung, as I called. And that was an application from 1930 to about 1956. And so most, most sailors that we know in this area uh, that are my age were trained in this particular aspect of it. From there, in 1946, they went to what they called the no breathing device. This is, if I'm not mistaken, is what they called the blow and go. All right? So you took your breath, you went outside, and you whistled all the way up. So that was called the blow and go. But they had a lot of problems with that because if you hold your breath, right, your lungs expand, and this is when you come down with the bends, air, air embolisms, and things of this nature. That was the reason for the recompression centers or uh, stations. Then they went to the uh, Bowen Ascent, and this is where they had a, uh, it's actually almost like a, a, a preserver that went around your neck. And you blew, but this helped you rise a lot quicker. But it was very, very important that you breathe. Because if you don't, that pressure is going to build up into your lungs. And again, you'll end up with the bends. So that went until 1960. And then they developed the stanky hood. And this was the actual hood that you put over your head. And you had the, the buoyancy uh, vest. But it was important that you breathe. And and, and I found out about this today. I, I couldn't find out until today because I had a lot of people saying, sailors saying, oh yeah, that was the ho, ho, ho. And that's what you did. You went inside this hood and they wanted you to breathe so you would go ho, ho, ho. So you were expelling air. So you weren't holding it in. So, and I saw a lot of comments on Facebook today. Ho, ho, ho. Remember that? Yeah, ho, ho, ho. So those are people that went through with the stanky hood. Now, this is the actual training course that the sailors went through. You saw what they, the, the procedures that they did, but now we're gonna, everybody's concerned about safety, everybody. Even back then, back then, I'm saying back then, 1930, we had safety precautions. There's, there's a crew of, of diving instructors. Uh, and I have all their names, and, and Mr. Baker, was a grot knight. Maybe a lot of people might remember him. He, uh, he was like a manager at the uh, Elks Club. And uh, he was one of the main divers uh, during the salvage of the Squalus, where they did bring up some submariners from a sunken submarine. Now, every one of those divers is a qualified diver. And before they could work as a diver in the tank, they worked six months of training in the tank before they were permitted to, to assist the submariners when they were uh, doing their training. There were always 10 divers assigned to the tank when there was operations going on. There was always a medical officer on duty. So if you came up with a bend or you had another medical emergency, they would take care of you. On the side, on the inside of the, the tank, there were what they called blisters. And they were, they were lockouts that some of the divers would stay in there and they could come right out. And if you had a problem, they would bring you either in there or they would bring you to another thing which they call a roving uh, diving bell. And there's the roving diving bell. And they could lower that and put you inside of it where there was air. And there's the diving bell in operation there. 
you were never, ever alone in the tank. You always had a diver instructor with you from the time you came out of the hatch till you got up. They would relay you in 25 feet uh, increments, but you always had a diver with you. So it was very safety conscious. And by the way, if you didn't pass, don't go. No submarines. This is the recompression chamber I talked about. They put you in there, and everybody's happy, right, until they close the door and put the 50 pounds up, and then you had to experience that pressure. And they had a medical person inside there with you. And if you couldn't take it, ring the bell, open it up, and the rest of the people would go back in and finish up their exercise, but you went back to the barracks and packed up. Then they would train you on how to operate the mumps and lung. You had several, several days of this. The, the actual training for the tank was two days. Uh, one day was cl classroom, and the other day was uh, actual in the tank. And there's the apparatus. Now, when you came out of the hatch, there was a, into the tank, there was a, a buoy rope that went to the top, and there were knots in it. And you would put your feet and your hands onto the rope and move yourself up, and when you reached a knot, you had to wait for a certain period of time, again, to avoid the air embolisms. And that's the buoy that came up from the bottom. Now, this is the 50-foot uh, ascent tank. Uh, this is the chamber that they would put it. They flood the chamber, then they open the inside hatch, and you go inside and start out the door. And there's a person coming out into the tank. This one has a stanky hook, a hood on, but you can see he has two divers with him right off the bat. And they'll remain with him. There'll be two divers the whole length coming up. Remember what I said about putting your feet and your hands on that rope so you can feel the knots? And that's, that's what this uh, person is doing. Again, accompanied by Two divers coming up. This one looks like the buoyancy thing where he has the vest and he's blowing. The blow and go, as we, as we say. Instructor checking the stanky hood out while they're still coming up. And now he's at the top. And that's quite an achievement, I'm, I'm sure if if I had been doing it, I said, man, I made it, All right? But you did it more than once. I believe you did it, you did it twice at the 18-foot level, then twice at the 50-foot level, and then they gave you an option if you wanted to do it at the 75-foot level or the 110-foot level. Now, it took me a while to get this tape, and, and uh, the library helped me out, the Submarine Force Library helped me out with this. Again, I won't apologize for the quality of things, and I'm going to turn to lights down just a little bit. This is a training film from 1953 of the diving operation. No, this huge tower is not a silo, but a water-filled classroom where men are trained in the use of the Momsen lung, known as the submarine parachute. A group about to try this safety device enters a decompression chamber where they will be subjected to a gradual application of 50 pounds of air pressure. To be assured that the men do not suffer any undue physical discomfort, a doctor or other qualified person is present. The lung resembles and works in rough principle like a gas mask. Air exhaled into the device passes through soda lime, which removes the waste carbon dioxide and replaces it with fresh oxygen. When each student has mastered the use of the lung, he is then ready for the first attempt at underwater breathing. The preliminary ascent is made from a very shallow level. First, the buoy is sent up attached to a line that will guide the men to the surface. The line is marked at regular intervals indicating where the men will pause for 10 breaths to allow the body to become adjusted to the decreasing pressure encountered in the ascent to the surface. 
And now for the real test, a trip to the top of the tank from the lowest level of the tower. The compartment is flooded until the pressure balances the weight of the water above. Charging their lungs with oxygen, the men pass up through the escape hatch one at a time, holding securely to the marker line and taking particular care to pause at the designated intervals for decompression. has safely reached the surface from a depth of 100 feet. This safety device was developed by the United States Navy and has been made available to all the fleets of the world in the interest of humanity and safety under sea. Graduation day brings final inspection of a group of men trained in the fundamentals of a hard, exciting game, ready to join the submarine flotillas of the United States Navy. I sat for hours watching these movies, and when I first found it, uh, I called Sean. It was on it was on on Google. And I contacted the company and I wanted those three minutes. And they wanted to charge me $250 for those three minutes. And the quality really isn't that well, but uh, fortunately the, the submarine force uh, got a copy of it and they provided it to me. But to be on the safe side, it was a different company. I contacted the other company, you saw it, Traditions across the, the screen. And I bought the entire two hours for $29. So we were, we were fortunate with that. Some notable events. This is what happened in April of 1968. Uh, the fire started in a, a room uh, and got into the elevator shaft. And it worked its way up into the cupola. And uh, that says $500,000, but it was a lot more than that uh, that caused the damage. The uh, submarine fire department, as well as local fire departments, all of Groton's fire departments pretty much responded. Uh, it took about four hours to extinguish it. It started at 3 o'clock in the morning. Here's the fire. Uh, again, this is at n a nighttime photograph, but I won't apologize for it because we have a photograph. There's some of the fire apparatus on the side. Uh, but the city fire department had a snorkel truck which could go a lot higher. There's that man spraying water, by the way. And you can see other firemen working their way up to the cupola. There's the city's snorkel truck, as they called it. Uh, one of a kind for the area. Uh, it's a great photograph. Now, there were two fire chiefs that were involved. Uh, one of them was uh, um, chief Viscovi from the submarine base, and then City of Groton Fire Chief uh, William Scarano, Bill Scarano, who happens to be one of my best friends, was responsible for putting that fire out. And by the way, Mr. Scarano is in the audience tonight, so uh, we're very pleased that he was, he was there and they brought this thing under control very rapidly. Now, the first women that were, sat, uh, that were certified here, this tank was used for, for everything. You know, we had I think we had uh, women uh, that were involved, not in the submarines, but with, the, with taking care of submarine, uh, submariners. So the, the first ones were certified in 1943. And uh, they were both ensigns. And I, I didn't notice till this week, you notice the, the dive uniform in the back? I never noticed that before. Uh, but they were qualified. And they, they were photographed while they were in training. There's that um, ONC vest, and they're teaching her how to <sighs> So you have that blow and go aspect of it. And there she's being assisted coming up. 
Now, like any other thing, we, we always add interest into it. We had some Hollywood visitors at that tank. We've had a lot of visitors, Hollywood visitors, to the, to the submarine base, but not to the tank. One of the first ones is Tyrone Powers. That's him here. And he was uh, the primary actor in a movie called Crash Dive that was filmed at the base. The majority of it was filmed at the base. And I read a story where he showed up late for one of the production things. And, and I guess there was a Navy <laughs> master chief there that really chewed him out. All right? you want to play, if you want to play Navy, you're going to play the real game. So they taught him how to play the real game. The terrible picture, the only picture we have, uh, it's a, a, a photograph out of a newspaper, is Brian Donnelly here. He has his daughter with him. And, uh, this is Brian Donnelly. And there's one of the movies he starred in. And you might recognize him in this photograph. That's him here. And that's the Fighting Coast Guard that was filmed in 1951. Esther Williams reportedly was at the tank. I have no photographs of her at the tank. That's the closest thing I could come <laughs> to, <laughs> you know, to kind of simulate that she was in the tank. But I do have a photograph of her uh, with a Captain Renskoff from the USS Trout. And it was in New London. And by, when they say New London, I would imagine it was tied up at the Fulton. That's the only thing I can think of. Well, that's her there. Kate Smith. She was there. Does everybody remember Kate Smith? A lot of people don't. And if you're a Yankee fan, you will. God bless America. Remember her now? And very interestingly there, she's signing a, she's signing a torpedo tube to Hitler, uh, autographing it, personally autographing it. But she was quite a patriot, a patriot. Now, the beginning of the end. Uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the cost of, uh, of repairing, it, it actually became obsolete. Some of the piping systems within the tank uh, became obsolete. So they did a study. Uh, and they figured it would cost $267,000 uh, to repair it. By the way, after the fire, within a year, they brought it back. I, I neglected to mention, but they brought it back and they continued to use it until about 1982. So that's when they found out it would cost about $270,000 to repair it, another $367,000 a year to operate it. But to uh, demolish it, it was $265,000. So they took the, took the easy way out. And now you got to remember, we're talking, we started in 1930. In 1982, in 1930, we're, we're working with diesel boats, and they go down 150, 200 feet. Now we're talking in the 1980s, we're talking nuclear boats that probably go double, triple that depth. So the use of blow and go and these things are not going to work. So they decided they would demolish it and uh, uh, build a new submarine uh, escape simulator. Uh, that was in, uh, they closed it in 1985. They made the decision to tear it down and build the new one in 1985. And the tank was actually taken down in 1992. That's one of the reasons why. That's another reason why right. it had deteriorated. There's no doubt about it. I have photographs of the pipes that were actually hanging out of the, out of the uh, equipment. This is the new Mumpson Hall. Uh, it's a, 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 a new escape training. Uh, this opened up in uh, 2009. And there's the new tank. Uh, it cost $18 million to build this one, all right? There's 84,000 84, gallons in here. 
It's 20 feet wide and it's only 40 feet deep. At the bottom of the tank, they have actual escape trunks, uh, simulated trunks that are on actual submarines. They, they built them into the bottom of the tank. And the submariners now uh, practice or drill with what they call an SEIE, a submarine escape and immersion equipment suits. Uh, that's one of the suits, and that's what they practice with. Uh, when we started the program, I mentioned that Groton had landmarks. Well, this was our landmark. Uh, the sailors coming and going, that would be the last thing they saw probably, and the first thing they, they could put their eyes on and say, I'm home. Uh, but we're fortunate in the aspect that even though the, the, uh, the structure has been taken down, it's always been part of our symbol, our logo for the submarine base. And I spoke with the present captain, Captain Weiss Carver, the other night, and I've spoken to two previous captains of the base, and they plan to keep that logo. So we will always have Groton landmark of the diving tower uh, present for us to enjoy. And I hope that as part of our submarine proud uh, ceremony that you've enjoyed the, uh, the program tonight, and I'm saying good night. Thank you.